Hi, everyone. So I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Nisha Bensal for Renal Grand Rounds today. Dr. Bensal is a professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology and the Arthur Statch Family Endowed Professor at the University of Washington and Kidney Research Institute. She is nationally and internationally recognized for her work in understanding the epidemiology and pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease in patients with chronic kidney disease. So most would say this is a rarity now in medicine, but Dr. Bensal truly epitomizes the term academic triple threat in medicine. She is accomplished in all three of the academic disciplines of research, education, and clinical care. On the clinical front, Dr. Bensal is the director of the UW Kidney Heart Service, where she takes her findings and ongoing research and applies them to provide excellent clinical care for her patients. On the education front, Dr. Bensal was the fellowship program director, where she lured a few of our Northwestern medicine residents to the UW program. Um, she now remains as the associate program director and is now the director of nephrology, clinical and research education across the division. And on the research side, the list of accolades are too, um, too many to enumerate. She has had active NIH funding since her nephrology fellowship, which is not an easy feat. Um, she's currently PI of three NIH-funded R01 grants. She has extensively published in top journals, um, both nephrology and others. Um, she's an associate editor for Kidney360. Um, but really, most importantly beyond this, she's a mentor to numerous medical students, residents, fellows, and junior faculty. She recently was awarded an NIDDK Investigator Award to support mentoring of early career faculty from diverse backgrounds or, or at K-26. She is chair of the DOM member, uh, Mentorship Committee and co-chair of the Gender Equity um, Council as well. I can personally attest to her commitment to mentoring, um, whether it be reading grant applications, whether it be providing opportunities to publish scholarly work, whether it be collaborating on manuscripts. Uh, Dr. Binsal is truly committed to fostering growth and mentoring and sponsoring individual physicians, especially women in nephrology. So let's give a warm and you welcome to Dr. Binsal. Wow. Um, I'm overwhelmed. That was such a kind, um, such a kind introduction, Rupal. And it's been such a joy to see Rupal and others just flourish and become such important leaders in our field. Um, oh, shoot. This is very sensitive. Give me a second. I'm getting to know this. Um, so it's an honor to be here today. You truly have a remarkable division. Um, and it's just been a really wonderful time to connect with old friends and meet new friends. So thank you again for inviting me. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about blood pressure in hemodialysis patients, finding the right target. So let's start with the case. So we have a 64-year-old man, history of diabetes and stage kidney disease. He's been treated with dialysis, hemodialysis for a year. He presents to the outpatient hemodialysis center, and his blood pressure is 160 over 90. This is his pre-dialysis blood pressure. He's taking him lodipine 10 milligrams daily at home. He has no symptoms and no complaints. He d you do note that he has a little bit of edema on his exam. So this is a patient that you are probably seeing every day. So what do you do in this case? Um, the first option is nothing. Um, his hypertension is all volume and will improve with dialysis. Next option is add another blood pressure agent to decrease his blood pressure to reach a goal of less than 140 over 80. Three, you could order a 44-hour um, ambulatory blood pressure monitor where he starts um, measuring his blood pressure at home from the time he leaves dialysis till he comes back for his next dialysis session. Um, four, ask him to monitor his blood pressure at home. Or five, refer him to his primary care doctor for management. So I'm not going to ask you to answer this, um, but in your head, think about what you would do in this patient. And I hope that over the next 40 minutes or so, we can try to um, answer this question together. So this is a common problem we see in our patients. So do the guidelines help us? What do they tell us? So um, the 2017 American College of Cardiology and the HA guidelines said that CKD patients should be treated to a goal blood pressure, a systolic blood pressure of less than 130. However, they did not mention dialysis patients. Kadoki, um, going a while back, said it is unclear what is the target for blood pressure and which blood pressure reading should be used as a guide for therapy in dialysis patients. And then most recently, just in 2021, KDGO updated their blood pressure guidelines, and they said adults with CKD and high blood pressure should be treated to a target systolic blood pressure of less than 120 using standardized um, techniques to measure blood pressure. However, they're very purposeful in that they do not comment on dialysis patients. 
So this sort of leads us in a conundrum right now in that we don't have a lot of guidelines helping us make these decisions. And why is this important? Well, I don't think I have to remind this audience, but nearly all of our patients who we treat with kidney failure who are treated with dialysis have hypertension. Um, we know it's one of the strongest risk factors we have for cardiovascular disease and death, which is still the number one cause of mortality in our patients. And importantly, what I get it, why I think this is important, it's something we can treat. There's ways to treat blood pressure, unlike a lot of um, biological abnormalities that our patients face. And I do think that this uh, d deserves special attention in patients on dialysis. But hypertension is different in this population. This is a schematic that we just published actually in hypertension, um, in which we, um, it's, a, it's a nice review of pathophysiology of hypertension in, in hemodialysis patients. But I think the take home message really is, is that we know that there's traditional risk factors certainly our patients have in terms of older age, inactivity, family history, and others that contribute to development of hypertension. But notably, there's a lot of other biological insults that are happening in our patients, including volume overload, arterial stiffness, neurohormonal upregulation, and others, which are clearly um, driving this process. And so this has led to a lot of unanswered questions on how best to treat hypertension in patients on dialysis. And so these are just a few of the questions that come to mind when I think about this problem. Um, you know, is high blood pressure actually bad in, in hemodialysis patients? What is the target blood pressure for hemodialysis patients? And which blood pressure should we be using to actually target our therapy? So first, let's review the data on, well, is high blood pressure bad in, in dialysis patients? And so I would say that it's a little bit confusing. Um, so, you know, the benefits of blood pressure reduction remain unclear in hemodialysis patients, mainly because it's very complex. Um, some studies have certainly shown that higher blood pressure is associated with higher risk of death. However, many have demonstrated this U-shaped association between blood pressure and risk of death. And what that means is that, so this is a typical U-shape, here on the x-axis, you have um, systolic blood pressure. On the y, um, the relative death rate. You can see that blood pressure that's low or slash normal, as well as high, are both associated with higher risk of death. So this has led to a little bit of confusion in terms of how to manage blood pressure. And lots of investigations have been done to, well, what is actually driving this U-shape? Um, and so things that have um, some possible um, hypotheses that have emerged in the field are, one, the U-shape is really driven by hemodynamic effects um, from volume. Two, that there could be some, um, some component of malnutrition that's contributing to this U-shape where both sides of the U are, are capturing patients that are different phenotypically. Um, three, that inflammation could be causing this. And the last one is that potentially there's confounding by systolic heart failure that many of the patients either with, very, with low slash normal heart, um, uh, blood pressure actually have unrecognized heart failure. And so unfortunately, a lot of these theories have not borne out, um, a lot of negative studies. And I'm just going to highlight one here um, in which um, the investigators looked at the association between blood pressure and 15-month rates of cardiovascular death and over 40,000 maintenance hemodialysis patients. And what they did was that they, um, they looked at, uh, they first looked at the association um, here in the, the top left is the pre-dialysis blood, um, systolic blood pressure. So focus on this top figure here. And they, they adjusted for um, a variety of different factors. So first they adjusted for traditional risk factors. And then they also looked at, um, they looked at what's called case mix. So they looked at inflammatory markers, nutritional markers, and other contributor, possible contributors to this U-shape. And what they saw was that the, actually the shape of the association did not change with adjustment for these additional factors, suggesting that um, this wasn't the cause of the U. And so where has this led us, left us as a field? Um, despite hypertension being so squarely focused in nephrology, I think it's led our field into a little bit of a conundrum in that we have uncertainty and a lot of heterogeneity in terms of how best to manage blood pressure in our patients who are treated with dialysis. 
And I would say that it does lead to permissive hypertension if people are, th if we think that higher blood pressure may be beneficial in some of these patients. So knowing that, do we have any data of what the target blood pressure should be in hemodialysis patients? So again, you know, going back to the guidelines, what do we know? So these, this is a list of the major hypertension guidelines, including the JNC-8, um, the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, the European Society of Cardiology and Hypertension, Hypertension Canada, as well as KDGO. And so these all look at different targets, and you can see their publication year spanning anywhere from 2014 to 2021. Um, and you can see that they all give slightly different targets. Um, again, these are all in CKD patients. Um, and so really no mention of hemodialysis patients. And I do want to highlight um, the SPRINT study here, because I do think that a lot of our nephrology care has been dictated, um, has been influenced by the findings of the SPRINT trial. So to remind you, the SPRINT trial, gosh, it's hard to believe it was published eight years ago now, but eight years ago, um, randomized over 9,000 participants who had high blood pressure but no diabetes. And they were randomized to two treatment groups, either a blood pressure target of less than 120 versus 140. And they were very intentional in rec over-recruiting patients with chronic kidney disease. Again, 28% um, of their patient population had CKD, but did, did not include dialysis patients again. And so what did they find? They found this large reduction in risk of cardiovascular endpoints, which was their primary target, um, with treatment to the lower blood pressure target of less than 120. And when they looked at the subgroup in CKD, again, they found this large risk reduction. So what about in dialysis patients? Do we have any data? And so um, one of the trials that has been published recently actually tried to tackle this problem, and this was called the Blood Pressure and Dialysis Trial, or the BID trial. In this trial, they randomized 126 hypertensive hemodialysis patients, and their two treatment groups were one, the intensive arm, which was 110 to 140, pre-dialysis blood pressure, and I just want you to take a moment to think about that if you compare that to SPRINT, in which their intensive arm was less than 120. So this used a higher intensive arm than it SPRINT did, um, versus a standard blood pressure treatment um, arm of a pre-dialysis blood pressure of 155 to 165. Um, they had a short follow time, but one year, and their primary outcome was feasibility and safety. And so um, first, you know, we want to look at, well, did they achieve their goals? So here we have the two groups of patients, um, the standard blood pressure treatment group and the intensive. And you can see, actually, they did re reach nice separation between the two groups. So their intervention was successful in that regard. Um, and so then they looked, um, sorry. I wasn't sure I skipped two ahead too. Um, and then they looked at uh, some other important outcomes, although these were not their primary outcomes. They did investigate rates of major adverse cardiovascular events, hospitalizations, vascular access thromboses, and visits to the ER. And so what they found, if you look at these data, is that they did see that in those that were treated in the intensive arm, so um, a blood pressure target of less than 140, there was higher rates of vascular access thromboses and hospitalizations. And so what about um, adverse effects? So this is quite important in our patients as they are subject to having more adverse effects from certain therapies. And so they looked at, um, low blood pressure, cramps, nausea, dizziness, dyspnea, chest pain, um, loss of consciousness, and seizures. And what they did see that there were higher rates of a lot of these events in the patients that were treated to the intensive arm. You know, so I think it's, this was an eye-opening trial for a lot of us in that it really brought home the point that blood pressure is different in patients on hemodialysis, and we certainly need larger studies to help understand what our blood pressure targets should be in this population. So that comes to the next um, unanswered question is, you know, knowing that, so BID really focused on pre-dialysis systolic blood pressure, but is that the right blood pressure we should be targeting? Um, which, you know, which one should we be using, pre-dialysis blood pressure, post-dialysis blood pressure, or non-hemodialysis blood pressure? And I, this is important because we know that patients 
um, who are treated with dialysis have blood pressures measured in lots of different scenarios. So they have um, blood pressures measured at their clinic visits um, with their other physicians, um, at the hemodialysis unit, and then home. So which blood pressure should we be measuring and treating? We have lots of blood pressures um, that are possibilities here. And it matters um, because each of these blood pressures that we could measure and treat are quite different with each other. Um, this was a, a meta-analysis that actually looked at level of agreement between pre-dialysis blood pressure with blood pressure measured outside the dialysis unit by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring led by Rajiv Agarwal. And what they did is that they looked at the entire collection of studies that measured both of these, pre-dialysis blood pressure and ambulatory blood pressure in hemodialysis patients, to look at the agreement between the two methods. And you can see their summative data really showed that there was um, really wide disagreement, I would say, between these two measures of blood pressure. So it makes a difference. The, they were off by anywhere between um, 41 to 25 millimeters mercury. So these are very disparate measures. And so um, another study um, led by Dr. Agarwal actually tried to answer this question um, more robustly in asking, well, does the setting of blood pressure measurement matter? Um, this was an observational study in which they took 326 patients in Indiana and they compared home um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring versus home blood pressure monitoring versus dialysis unit blood pressures. They followed the patients for about three years. Um, and surprisingly, they did not find any association of either pre or post hemodialysis blood pressure with mortality. And when they looked at the, the functional form of the relationships between blood pressure and mortality, both for ambulatory as well as home blood pressure, they found one is that ambulatory and, blood, ambulatory and home blood pressure agreed pretty well, but was really nonlinear. So again, this led a lot of questions of, you know, which blood pressure should we be measuring? They didn't see any association of their dialysis unit blood pressures with outcomes, and these were difficult to interpret. And so, you know, from this work, um, I think, it's really shown that associations of blood pressure with outcomes in hemodialysis patients may differ based on the setting of blood pressure measurement. Um, you know, and I think there's more work to be done in this area in that prior studies were either single center or focused only on mortality as an outcome. And so actually, um, this was my K award. I was telling somebody that this, this talk feels like a journey through my professional career, um, but this was one of the first studies that I designed in which we aim to look at the association of blood pressure and cardiovascular disease and death in hemodialysis patients. And this was an um, ancillary study to the chronic renal insufficiency cohort study, which many people in, this, uh, in the audience actually work very closely with. And so we asked the questions, in this multi-center larger study, what was the association of blood pressure and risk of death as well as cardiovascular events among patients treated with hemodialysis? And we were very interested in the setting of blood pressure matter. Was this association consistent using pre-dialysis blood pressure versus non-hemodialysis um, measured blood pressure? And so um, for the dialysis unit blood pressure, we actually went through the dialysis records for each of the participants and, and, and abstracted their pre-dialysis unit blood pressures. And then their out of dialysis unit blood pressures were measured at a study visit. Our outcomes were mortality and a composite cardiovascular endpoint. And so what did we see? So we first looked at the association of pre-dialysis systolic blood pressure with risk of death, which is the figure on the left, and cardiovascular events on the right. And so this is a, a spline, and so this is showing you the functional form of the association. On the bottom here, along the x-axis, first you have the distribution of blood pressure, of systolic blood pressure. And then, um, and then along the y-axis, the hazard ratio for death as well as cardiovascular events. And so what we see here is, again, that we've replicated this U that was seen in previous studies. Um, and notably, you know, the nadir of this U, meaning where the lowest risk was, was a blood pressure around 140 to 160. Um, and, you know, we saw, although there was, um, you can see the confidence intervals that the tails are a little bit wide for this figure, but roughly we were seeing the same association um, with, the, with cardiovascular events as well. 
So again, we confirmed this U shape, still a little bit confusing. Um, you know, I think what was hard to wrap our heads around was that based on these figures, that you know, the blood pressure range, which I would think of as a reasonable target, 120 to 140, was actually associated with higher risk of death as well as cardiovascular events. And then in the real world, it's very hard to tell a clinician to target a blood pressure in a 20 millimeter mercury range. So, you know, is this feasible in practice? And so what, what should we do with this? And so we took these same participants, the same exact um, number uh, participants that we measured the pre-dialysis blood pressure on, and we looked at their blood pressure on a non-dialysis day. And now what we saw was this very straight, linear, and positive association where higher blood pressures linked with um, higher risk of death as well as higher risk of cardiovascular events, sort of what you would expect when you think about blood pressure, especially looking at the general population. And so what this really brought to us is, well, should we be paying more attention to blood pressure that's measured on a non-dialysis day in approaching care of these patients? And so, um, you know, again, the implications from this epidemiologic work to date was, well, really raise the question, you know, which blood pressure should we be targeting I think that there's lots of issues with focusing solely on pre-dialysis blood pressures. Again, this nadir of the U, where the lowest risk of cardiovascular events and mortality was, was around 140 to 160, which is, feels a little bit uncomfortable when you think about other populations. Again, it's difficult to target the nadir of this U shape. Um, and I think it, it leads to challenges. You know, when a clinician is rounding on a patient in the dialysis unit, how do you approach this? I think you could, it may lead to permissive hypertension. Um, it could also lead to overtreatment of, of, of blood pressure as pre-dialysis blood pressure is usually greater than non-dialysis blood pressure. So we felt the only way forward was to do a clinical trial. And so this was uh, the BOLD trial. This is called the Blood Pressure Lowering in, in Dialysis Trial, which was funded by the NIDDK. Um, and so the trial had two aims. One was to determine the feasibility and adherence to measure and treat home, bl uh, home blood pressure versus pre-dialysis blood pressure in hemodialysis patients. And the second was to test the safety and tolerability of an intervention to treat home blood pressure in hemodialysis patients. This was a pilot trial, and so we were really focused on feasibility, safety, and tolerability. And in the design of the trial, we were very intentional in that we were using the same blood pressure target for both of the treatment groups because we were focused on the setting rather than the blood pressure target itself. And so um, we had two sites, um, the University of Washington, Seattle, where I'm based, and then UCSF, where um, I actually, where I previously was. Um, we recruited 50 patients in total, 25 in each treatment group, and it was a parallel two-arm randomized control trial where we treated patients for four months. It was non-blinded. And I do want to give a shout out to my investigative team. Um, Chi Xu at UCSF um, was my co-PI in this study. Raj Marotra, who's my division chief, and um, was also a co-investigator. And Ray Townsend, who's a blood pressure expert at Penn, was also um, a very important co-investigator. And so our usual care uh, treatment arm was that we treated pre-dialysis systolic blood pressure to achieve um, a goal of less than 140. Um, in the home group, again, we were asking patients to measure their blood pressures at home at least twice a week, um, during, uh, twice a week during the duration of the study. And again, we were targeting a home blood pressure of less than 140. For all of the participants, we would have them take their blood pressures for two weeks at a time, and then our study team would look at the blood pressures and deliver our interventions. And the, how did we treat their blood pressures? We used a very pragmatic approach. So this was a very collaborative study in which we worked closely with the nephrologist, and so if they were not meet, meeting the targets every two weeks of, the, of a blood pressure of less than 40, based on whichever treatment group they were in, we first focused on dry weight adjustment, um, and then also titrated blood pressure medications that were pretty standard in care, many of which they were already taking. And so again, our primary outcomes were feasibility, adherence, safety, as well as tolerability. So this was our concert diagram. Um, and so I like to highlight this because I think in nephrology we have 
a perception that it's very hard to do clinical trials, and it is. This was my first clinical trial that I did. But I was pleased at how eager participants were, to, patients were to participate. So we approached 70 patients. Out of the 70, the majority wanted to participate. Um, and if only 15 declined. Um, so to me, that's a, that's a sign that patients are eager to be in studies. They want to be in trials in, in nephrology. Um, and so once patients were consented to participate, we did have a few people that were ineligible, um, either because they were moving or they were unable to complete the study. But in the end, we randomized 50 to both treatment groups. We only had one person withdraw during the entire study, and that was because they got a transplant, which was wonderful for them. And so uh, this is the, uh, these are the demographics of, uh, of our patient population. Again, it was a very f small trial, but I have to say that I was proud of the diversity that we were able to achieve even with a small sample size. So we had um, almost, you know, a pretty good distribution of men and women. Um, in terms of racial and ethnic diversity, we did have um, a high proportion of racial, um, of racial and ethnic minorities within, across both sites. And in Seattle, we're actually, we, um, we have a fair amount of Hawaiians as well who live in our region, so um, it's been really wonderful to include them in our studies. And so what did we see from this study? So first, um, these are the characteristics of their blood pressure at the time of enrollment, so before, um, before we did anything. So you can see that the two groups um, had pretty similar blood pressure, but regardless of whether they're randomized to the home or the dialysis unit blood pressure treatment group. Um, and then they were all, people were taking on average about two to three blood pressure medications at the time of randomization. You know, so one thing, one challenge that we anticipated is how do you get patients who are treated with dialysis to take their blood pressure at home? This is a population of patients that are so medicalized, they, you know, so entrenched in medical care for so much of their days, can we motivate them to actually do this? And so, Adherence was a big part of this study, um, and so this is looking at the proportion of study visits across the entire treatment period in which we were able to get um, blood pressure readings for. So 94% of all the study visits across all the study participants, we were able to get a complete set of home blood pressure readings. 4% we were able to, we only got one blood pressure reading versus the two a week and only 3% were not able to do any blood pressures during that treatment period. And what's important is that over the course of study, we didn't see um, significant attrition. People didn't get bored, they didn't get tired of it, they actually continued to do their blood pressure measurements at home. And when we asked participants, we did a qualitative survey at the end, you know, how, what was this experience like for you? Um, patients said 95% of the participants in our study agreed that home blood pressure measurements were easy to do. We did train them, but made it easy. And 100% of them said that they would definitely or probably recommend that hemodialysis patients take their blood pressure at home. We also um, spent a lot of time in terms of how, once they take their blood pressure at home, how do they give it to us? How do they get it to us? So, you know, in this study, we had them. Um, we had them write it down. We sometimes we had them text it to us. We let it, left it pretty open. But it, we knew our goal was to do a larger study. So we asked, how would you like to get, send your home blood pressures to us? And overwhelmingly, um, people preferred text messaging or phone calls to deliver that. They didn't want to write it down on a paper log. And so what did we find in the study? So this is looking at um, pre-dialysis. Um, blood pressure amongst those patients um, who are treated in, uh, sorry, pre-dialysis blood pressure in, in the two treatment groups. The, the blue line were the patients in the dialysis treatment group, and the black line was in, in the home, dial, home blood pressure treatment group. So you can see that at the beginning of the study, they started off fairly similar, and by about, um, about six weeks, we started to see separation between the two groups, which was pretty good. When we looked at the um, patients in the home dialysis treatment group, um, home blood pressure treatment group, again, we saw that home blood pressure was lower than pre-dialysis blood pressure for the entire duration of the study, and we were able to keep that separation between the two groups. So what did we do to um, cause the separation between the two treatment groups, which was the aim of the study? 
it was a lot of dry weight adjustments. Um, so this is looking at what our treatment protocol actually was. So looking at the number of dry weight adjustments per person over the four month period and changes in medications. And you know, to summarize, what we're seeing here is that on average over four months, we were doing anywhere from one to three um, changes in dry weight, which is pretty aggressive, usually 0.5 kilos at a time. Um, and we were making changes to blood pressure medications, in many cases peeling blood pressure medications off as we were adjusting dry weight, which was actually wonderful for patients. Um, you know, the average dialysis patient takes about 19 pills a day, so if you can peel off a blood pressure medication, it's a huge quality of life improvement. We also looked at rates of intradialytic hypotension as that was an interest of an adverse outcome as well as shortened treatments due to cramping. And we did not see a difference between the two groups. We looked at tolerability and ad other adverse outcomes including highs and lows of pre or post dialysis blood pressures, falls, syncopes, and other complications of treating blood pressure. The only thing that we noted was that there was a little bit more fatigue in those patients who were treated in the home blood pressure group. However, I would say that our way of measuring fatigue was maybe not the best. So take that with a grain of salt. So we did do a sub-study in this larger trial in which we, um, we paid participants extra to actually do 44-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitoring as another measure, gold standard measure of blood pressure. And, um, and so we did this in a group of about 25 people, and we then looked at what was the best correlate, you know, how well did home blood pressure, especially with treatment of home blood pressure over time, correlate with this gold standard 44-hour bl ambulatory blood pressure measuring? And what we found was actually um, really helpful. So these are the, um, the correlation plots where you can look at the correlations between each of our, our parameters here. But I would say the biggest take home message was that we found that um, home blood pressure had, was best correlated with ambulatory blood pressure, um, daytime systolic blood pressure in the initial 24 hours post dialysis. So it's pretty good actually. And if you look at these correlation plots, they line up pretty well, correlation coefficients 0.7 or so, which was um, fairly good. And we looked more carefully of how ambulatory blood pressure changed um, with treatment of our, with either treatment of home blood pressure or pre-dialysis blood pressure. Um, and we didn't see a huge amount of change probably because our, um, our sample size was smaller for this sub-study. It was very hard to get patients to wear an ambulatory blood pressure monitor for 44 hours. Um, but I do think that it was interesting that we saw a little bit of improvement in non-dipper status compared in the patients that were treated with the home blood pressure versus pre-dialysis blood pressure. We also asked patients, what was the experience like of measuring your home blood pressure versus ambulatory blood pressure? And we published this um, work um, a few years ago, and what, oops, sorry. Um, what we found was the following, you know, I think overall, people really liked the autonomy and the independence and the process of measuring their home blood pressures. Um, you know, we had a little bit of complaints about the device, which was which could be cumbersome, but you know, ambulatory blood pressure was largely very negative experiences. I mean, to have a, I actually wore an ambulatory blood pressure monitor during the study to see what it was like. You know, the cuff inflates every 30 minutes during the day and every hour um, at night. It's hard to sleep. My partner certainly was not appreciative of me wearing this at night either. Um, you know, so I think from a patient perspective, if we can move, think, or change our thinking that ambulatory blood pressure monitoring may not be feasible, but we should focus on home blood pressures. And so what, what did we learn? We learned um, from the study that it's feasible to work with nephrologists and dialysis unit staff to treat home blood pressures, that dialysis patients are willing and motivated to measure their blood pressures at home, but certainly this was a pilot study and we needed more data on efficacy as well as safety. And so since then, we've been fortunate to receive additional funding to do an, a larger clinical trial, um, which is ongoing right now. Um, so, I'll, so I'll take a few minutes just to tell you about what we're doing. So in this study, we're recruiting 200 maintenance hemodialysis um, patients. And we're again randomizing patients to home blood pressure versus a pre-dialysis blood pressure target of less than 140. Um, and our primary outcome is intradialytic hypotension. 
We're also looking carefully at the correlation of these two measures as we under these different treatment strategies over the course of the trial. And then importantly, from my perspective, you know, interventions are only as good as they are until we can get them to our patients. And so a major part of this study is actually an implementation science aim in which we're measuring um, nephrologists' perceptions, attitudes, and beliefs about home blood pressure treatment. And so as I mentioned, we are recruiting 200 patients, um, again in Seattle and San Francisco. Our primary outcome is intradialytic hypotension, but we're also looking at fatigue, cramping, and hospitalizations. And as an exploratory aim, we're also measure, targeting a lower home blood pressure target to give us some insight in terms of whether blood pressure targets should be different for home blood pressure. And so this is our schematic. This is, it's actually a crossover study. So patients are recruited. They're randomized to the first period, and they could be either one of the two treatment groups, home versus pre-dialysis. Then after five months, they cross over to the alternative treatment group. And then at the end of 10 months, they have the option to enroll in this, um, this final treatment group, which is a home systolic blood pressure of less than 130. Um, we're seeing the patients every two weeks, and in that time, reviewing all their blood pressure data and making changes to their blood pressure regimen. A key, um, a key change that we made in the study is that um, we brought eHealth to the dialysis unit. So each patient is trained on, their home, on how to measure their blood pressure at home using an Omron device, which is Bluetooth enabled. Every patient is provided a tablet, um, which we train them on. And so when they make, take their blood pressure at home, um, they, it, it syncs to their d tablet. It sends it up to, oops, sorry. This, it sends it up to the cloud and then sends it directly to our, our data management system. So it's this continuous cycle where we're getting their blood pressures in real time and the onus is taken off of the participants to actually met, write down their blood pressures or track them and get them to us. And so it takes that, that piece away from them. And so again, um, we, and then we're t make, uh, ascertaining their pre-dialysis blood pressures from the dialysis units and, and and our treatment protocol is such that we're, again, focusing largely on dry, dry weight adjustment. And so for the first step, no matter if their blood pressure is out of range, our first step is really a volume assessment. We see if they're hypervolemic or not. If so, then it's really to adjust their dry weight. If they're not hypervolemic, that's when we start titrating medications. And I would say for the most part, what we're doing is adjusting medications people are already on versus starting medications. And so how are we doing? Um, so the black line here is our um, recruitment targets. And so as you can see, we're actually doing quite well in recruitment. We've recruited over half of our study population so far. And I mentioned implementation. And so we've been focused on two studies um, that have focused on implementation of home blood pressure. Um, and so the goal of this is really to identify barriers and facilitators to implementing routine home blood pressure measurement and treatment in the real world. And so as I mentioned, um, we're serving nephrologists who are involved in our study, both at the beginning of the study and the end of the study, to, to test their, how they feel about acceptability of home blood pressure treatment. And then the other thing we're doing is that we just got a new um, source of funding through the NIDDK, which is actually using behavioral change theories in a mixed method study using both qualitative as well as quantitative methods to understand what motivates patients as well as clinicians to change behaviors to accept this as potentially a new way to treat blood pressure. And so going back to our case, which I presented at the beginning of the, of the talk, you know, we have our patient who's coming into um, dialysis um, with an elevated blood pressure. What do you do? If it was me, I would probably do one of, the, one of the two, either order a 44 ambulatory blood pressure monitor or ask him to monitor his blood pressure at home. But truthfully, after seeing the data of how much patients dislike ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, I'd probably ask him to monitor his blood pressure at home. So to conclude, um, Traditional treatment of in-center hemodialysis patients, um, in-center hemodialysis blood pressure measurement may not be the optimal approach for blood pressure management. 
Our findings, at least from our pilot study and our trial to date, um, suggest that home blood pressure monitoring and treatment in hemodialysis patients may be feasible. I think our preliminary safety and tolerability signals are promising, um, but certainly we need the data from the larger trial to test um, intermediate efficacy and safety. And, you know, importantly, interventions are only as good as we, they are until we can get them to our patients. And so I'm incredibly excited about the mixed methods work we're doing, which is both talking to nephrologists as well as patients to understand what they, they perceive as barriers for this in the real world. I want to acknowledge the University of Washington as well as the Kidney Research Institute where I'm based um, and then the funders for all this blood pressure work. And I'm happy to take questions. Yes. Yeah, those are great points, and I agree with you. I mean, I think, you know, studies have shown that intradialytic blood pressure variability is also linked with poor outcomes, you know, sympathetic drive, other, other abnormalities that are induced by hemodialysis itself. You know, and I think, that, I think that that's why dialytic blood pressure is so problematic, and we've been trying to shift the focus to non-dialysis blood pressure where you don't have these same biological, acute biological disturbances which are driving up all these other hormonal processes and inflammatory processes, maybe at, you know, they're more in steady state on a non-dialysis day, which would allow a better assessment of what their true blood pressure is. So yeah, I agree. Great points. Thank you. Yeah. I think it's a combination of both things, right? I mean, first of all, I think we all know when a patient shows up to dialysis, they're running late, they're, they're you know, it's always this rushed thing, right? So they show up to dialysis, they're standing, they have this, these huge coats on, especially here in Chicago in the winter, right? How good are these measurements of pre-dialysis? So I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of measurement error that happens in, in the dialysis unit. Um, two, I think that, you know, being in the medical setting certainly can make those readings higher, but there's also physiologic disturbances. You know, they're volume overloaded, they have electrolyte imbalances, all those are driving up processes that could upregulate their blood pressure as well. And so I think that there's um, some correctable and non-correctable things that explain these differences between home and pre-dialysis, um, which has made it really challenging to get, figure out what the true blood pressure is.
Yeah, great questions and very real world questions. So we did look at post dialysis blood pressure and observational data, um, and we saw that it was again that U shaped. It was shifted to the left, meaning lower blood pressure ranges, but still this U shape where high and low was both um, associated with higher risk of mortality and cardiovascular events. You know, the decision to do um, Pre-dialysis blood pressure was um, mainly because it's a little bit more standardized in the unit because we know that everyone gets it. Um, you know, people shorten their runs, they come off early, things happen. And so sometimes getting post-dialysis blood pressure consistently can be problematic. And also most of the guidelines, at least um, published to date, although they're largely not super specific at this point, have focused on pre-dialysis blood pressure. So we've... Um, we did a small study when we were designing the trial where we surveyed um, nephrologists at our sites locally, and they were looking at pre-dialysis blood pressure the most, so that's, that was another reason to focus on pre-dialysis. In terms of the patients that remain consistently volume overloaded with large intradilytic weight gains, it's a problem. We're seeing it even in the trial. Um, we spend a lot of time trying to convince people to um, come in for extra UF runs. They often don't show up. Huge intradialytic weight gains. We do dietary counseling. Uh, in those cases, if they're depending on their treatment group, at least what we're doing is that if we know we can't change behaviors, we do add blood pressure medications. And we've had some patients tell us that they'd rather take a blood pressure medication to get more dialysis or restrict what they're drinking or eating. Um, not super satisfying because volume management feels so fixable um, and so good for them in so many ways. Um, so, you know, we'll, we're going to look at those data too in, in this trial of how successful were we with dry weight management um, to reach our blood pressure targets. That is a great question, and I'm going to show you. That's exactly what. Um, so, yeah. So when we looked at the in our pilot study, we looked at the correlation between pre and home, and it was 0.3. So terrible. And so this aim two is actually asking the exact question that you just asked. So when we treat somebody, say that they're in the um, home blood pressure arm can we develop a correction factor? Or if they're in the pre-dialysis arm, can we predict, oh, their home blood pressure is always going to be 10 millimeters mercury lower than their pre-dialysis blood pressure? And is that consistent with treatment? And so that's exactly what AIM-2 is doing. So regardless of treatment group, all patients in the study are measuring home blood pressure consistently. So we can look at these correlations over time and whether they are in, in, intra, in blood pressure differences intra-individual as well as across all of the individuals in our study to see if we can actually come up with a correction factor that avoids the need of patients measuring their blood pressure at home. 
based on the data that we looked at in our pilot study of only 50 patients, it didn't appear so, but this, sec this larger trial hopes to answer that question. So you're thinking that's exactly a question we got from the reviewers, which is why we put AIM2 in, so thank you. Maybe you were the reviewer. <laughs> Thank you for having me.